You're just going to investigate a brand new crime. Will you take the case? Take a break then, you deserve it. You can travel around in explore mode if you'd like. In this job, even vacations count as research. Give a call when you're ready to get back to work. It's a privilege to meet you. I'm Diplomacy. When I'm not moderating international negotiations or promoting world peace, I work as an Acme Good Guide. This happens to be one of the most fascinating states in the USA. So if you're ready for the Grand Tour, let's begin. I had a dream the other night when everything was still Thought I saw my Georgia bell coming down the hill Find a Georgia for now to stand Find a Georgia where my life will win For a hundred years, Alabama's wealth was based on cotton, growing it, selling it, and shipping it out to make clothes for the world. These days, the state is more economically diverse. But if you hear someone mention the land of cotton, they probably mean this place. The civil rights movement began here in Montgomery in 1955 when Rosa Parks refused to move to the back of a bus, even though the law said black people couldn't sit up front. She touched off a movement that challenged racially discriminatory laws throughout the country. Here's my favorite spot in Montgomery, the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. In the 1950s, Martin Luther King Jr. preached here, promoting freedom, equality, and nonviolence, the perfect ingredients for true democracy, if you ask me. Not far from here stands the first White House of the Confederacy, where President Jefferson Davis lived at the start of the Civil War. He left Montgomery after a few months, but didn't take the house with him. Mobile homes didn't come until later. See that big dome? Well, it's not a planetarium, so it must be a capital. The Alabama Capitol Building, to be exact. The state government has done its business here ever since 1846. Well then, until we meet again. Welcome to Montgomery, the capital of Alabama. Let's take a stroll and see the sights. Well then, until we meet again. idea coming at you. Don't let the youthful looks fool you. I'm a regular titan of tinkering and maestro of all things mechanical. Tantalizing technology and gallons of gadgets are my domain. Luckily the good old US of A is brimming with cool engineering so we'll have plenty to talk about. Check out those massive crude oil tanks. Evidence of the petroleum industry that runs thick in Alaska. This state has loads of natural resources, and oil is one of the most valuable. The Alaskan Pipeline, a technical wonder running 800 miles across the Alaskan interior, makes it easy to transport oil from inland oil fields to shipping ports on the coast. It's way sophisticated.
The fun doesn't set with the sun in these parts, because nighttime means a chance to see the dazzling Aurora Borealis, better known as the Northern Lights. Imagine awesome waves of colored light streaking and arcing through the midnight sky, and only up here near the North Pole. How's it work? Think fluorescent bulb on a global scale. Electrons stream from the far off sun and pow! Collide with atoms in the high Arctic atmosphere, generating brief flashes of light. Seen from the ground, it's pure magic. The three objects here, a Russian ship anchor, a Tlingit Indian totem pole, and a Russian cannon pretty much sum up Sitka's island history. Russian sailors and traders arrived in Sitka, met the native Tlingits who had lived here for centuries, and pretty much pushed them out. There were several big battles in 1802 and 1804, but modern weapons like the Russian cannon meant that Sitka would become Russia's Alaskan capital for the next 60 years. That's a prospector statue, standing proudly in front of the Pioneer House. It's a symbol of the grit and perseverance pioneering people needed to start a life in Alaska a century ago. The Pioneer House is actually the first building around here designed as a retirement home for older people. Even the hardiest gold prospectors eventually ran out of steam and needed to settle down. The Cathedral of St. Michael's here in the center of the business district stands out as a symbol of Sitka's Russian past. The cathedral was built by the Russian Orthodox Church back when Russia controlled the area. It's a sophisticated design built from a simple material, hardwood, which might explain how the whole thing managed to burn to the ground in 1966. What we see here is a faithful reproduction. Bye for now. Feel free to call me back for more techno facts. The sights here at Sitka, Alaska always put a cold chill in my spine. Let's explore around. Bye for now. Feel free to call me back for more techno facts. Hi, Rock Solid here. Geologist, botanist, ecologist, and economy-sized detective. Acme needed a good guide who was in tune with nature, so I volunteered for the job. Now let's hike around this intriguing little piece of our planet. Here's Elephant Rock, one of the red rock hills that surround Sedona. It changes color all day, reflecting different shades as the sun moves across the sky. I've spent whole days watching these hills, when I wasn't tracking a crook, of course. Most of the USA's copper comes from the red Arizona earth, much of it removed by strip mining. Companies dig huge pits to get at the ore, stripping the surface from miles and miles of delicate desert. If mining has to be done, I think it should be done in a more earth-friendly way. A little bit of extra effort can go a long way towards saving the environment. Sycamore and pine trees cling to the hills around Sedona. But Arizona has an official state tree that's straight out of the high desert. The saguaro cactus. It's tall, strong, prickly, and thrives in harsh conditions. A lot like me. Many Arizona landmarks have ancient names from native tribal languages, but this one has a more contemporary handle. Since it looks like the head of a particularly famous dog, folks around here call it Snoopy Rock. If you're wondering why Sedona's hills are red, the answer is simple. They're full of red minerals like copper and iron. 
You might think iron is black, but remember what happens when it gets wet. Rust. This is one of the driest states in America. But the government has spent billions of dollars to pipe water from the Colorado River into central Arizona, turning dry desert into farmland. People have a lot of different opinions about whether this type of irrigation is a good or bad thing to do. Just between you and me, I prefer the desert dry. Bye-bye! This is Sedona, Arizona. If you're ready for some of the most beautiful desert on Earth, I'm ready to show you. Come up here, my little Bessie. Come up here. Bye-bye. Hey there, Renaissance here, ready to help orchestrate your efforts to end Carmen's criminal record. I just melt for good music, I have a passion for painting, and I just ache for grand architecture. As a good guide, I can pull some strings and give you tours of great locations. Let's go. The old mill was built in 1933, and not by a carpenter, but by an artist. It looks authentically complete and weather-beaten, but actually has no doorways or windows underneath the facade. Think there's a window behind that shutter? Think again. The old mill is a good symbol of early rural Arkansas, where cotton was the main crop, and sawmilling the first industry. I guess back in those days when life was a bit slower than today, people were always milling about. The artist who created the old mill also designed the footbridges, like this one. His name was Senor Dionico Rodriguez, and he specialized in creating imitation rocks, ruins, and ancient buildings. Wow! Not every artist is good enough to create brand new things that already look antique. Over yonder in the Ozark Mountains, the limestone hills echo with the sound of down-home music during the Arkansas Folk Festival, where it sure takes pluck to fiddle with the banjo. Next time you breeze through North Little Rock, check out the old mill, which was filmed during the opening scenes of Gone with the Wind. That movie just blows me away. See you later. Hi there. I have some sights to show you here in Arkansas. See you later. <laughs> Things are always looking sunny here in California. There's lots to see in Yosemite, so let's start a tour. From the first time John Muir saw this beautiful valley in 1868, he dedicated himself to protecting it. Twenty-two years later, Yosemite became a national park because of Muir's work. Then he started the Sierra Club. Talk about a fellow with a lot of positive energy. Most people who tour Yosemite do it by car. The 200 miles of road are nice, but if you really want to see the place, hike the nature trails. 
They cover three times as much area as the roads, and no one ever gets a flat tire. For a great view of the whole Yosemite Valley, climb up there to the top of Glacier Point. It's the best panorama in all of California. 360 degrees of wow. Of Yosemite's many mountains, this might be the most famous, Half Dome. Long ago it was pointy, but Ice Age glaciers sanded it down and rounded it off. Of course, the weather still changes the mountains a little bit every day through erosion. Geology might move slowly, but it never stops. Yosemite covers a huge hunk of the Sierra Nevadas, from its 13,000-foot peaks to its glacial valley, with giant sequoia trees, tiny ferns, rivers, waterfalls, cliffs, and 429 lakes in between. Someday I'll see all 1,200 square miles of it, but not this time around. The water in Yosemite Falls does exactly what its name says. It falls, 2,500 feet to be exact. It makes such a mist that even standing 50 feet away, you'll get soaked. But it's worth getting wet to see beauty like that. Bye-bye. Here's my game. I love to study how society works, and right now I'm feeling very social. Let's take a tour around here and see who we meet. Be a tough one and take on great big giants. Modern sculptures like this one reveal that the people of Aspen really like to branch out into the arts. With a jazz festival, film festival, art museum, and dance group, Aspen is a center of high culture in the lofty Rocky Mountains. But I got a homeboy's a good one, you all know. Although I haven't seen it for many years ago. But I'm going back to Dixie once more to... This is Wheeler Block, named after a wealthy investor who helped Aspen reach its peak. Although silver mining was the first industry in this town, you could say later residents struck gold when they turned Aspen into a premier ski resort. See them all. I'm going to see my mom. In Aspen, outdoor activities don't dribble away when the snow melts. During the summer, these mountains are perfect for hiking, biking, whatever's to your liking. You can have a ball playing golf, or if tennis is your racket, you'll find that here too. When the work's all done this fall, I am a... Over here, you can see the Ute City Bank, once the headquarters of Mr. H.P. Cowenhoven, one of the area's first silver prospectors. In the late 1800s, Aspen was just one of several mining boom towns. But with two railroads, rich silver mines, and even richer investors, Aspen prospered while its neighbors faded into ghost towns. Cowboy, cowboy, I'm here all dressed in rags. That's Aspen Mountain, where the area's first ski resort opened. The area's economy would have faced an uphill climb if investors hadn't recognized Aspen's perfect ski conditions and opened the world's longest ski lift here in the 1940s. Since then, the city has grown faster than a downhill ski run. Used to be a tough one and take on great big jobs. Aspen was founded near the summer hunting grounds of the Ute Indians. In fact, people originally called the town Ute City, but it was Uteless. <laughs> the name didn't stick. More people rooted for a connection to the beautiful local trees, and Aspen...
Aspen became the official city name. So long. Let's talk again soon. But I got a homeboy, the good thing you all know, although I haven't. Come on, let's hit the slopes of Aspen, Colorado. It for many so long, let's talk again soon. Many years ago, but I'm going back to the once more. <laughs> Hi, we'll have a whale of a time touring Connecticut's old whaling town called Mystic. It's no fluke that this ship, the Charles W. Morgan, is still around. It's a classic example of an old three-masted wooden whaling ship built back when shipbuilding was an art form. Connecticut was once the leading whaling state, back when fleets of ships hunted down whales for their oil, which was used to make soap, wax, and other products. The U.S. today has banned most whaling, which makes me happy, because I love whale song. I'll bet the whales are happy about it, too. It's not a mystery why this town called Mystic prospered. During the 19th century, over 300 ships were built in this shipyard. Today, the recreated town of Mystic Seaport serves as a living window to sailing history. See what I mean? Fishing villages like this one are typical of Connecticut, which is an Indian word meaning long tidal river with its miles of Atlantic coastline. Connecticut sure is beautiful, isn't it? Here in Mystic, you can watch traditional shipbuilders constructing sailing vessels by hand. Before the invention of steam engines, tall, masted clipper ships were the fastest vessels in the world and the most elegant. Try putting one of these in a bottle. See you later. of facts about historic Newcastle, Delaware. Many flags have flown over the historic town of Newcastle. The city was founded by the Dutch, captured by the Swedes, and eventually fell under British control. During the Revolutionary War, the town sided with the colonies, and Newcastle became the first capital of Delaware. unusual building is the old library museum. A series of skylights and light sinks brighten up the interior and even the basement level. I guess you could say this museum really sheds light on some works of art. I'm just burning to tell you about this building, the Emanuel Church and Tower, built in the late 1600s. Unfortunately, a recent fire burned down everything but the walls, which were then used to reconstruct the building we see today. This Dutch treat is the Dutch House Museum. It was built in 1707 and represents a fine example of Dutch colonial style.
The building has been well preserved, hardly changing a bit in nearly three hundred years. Talk about being set in your ways. Over here, you can see the old arsenal, which was built in 1809. The arsenal served as an ammunition storehouse during the War of 1812, but now it's a restaurant. Hmm. A history ranging from gunpowder to gourmet cuisine. Now there's food for thought. So long. Let's talk again soon. What a blast! Let's orbit around the space gear here at Florida's JFK Space Center. It may look like a stubby airplane, but this is actually the Explorer, a full-size space shuttle replica that people can climb aboard. The space shuttle represents a significant improvement over earlier rocket technologies. It blasts straight up into space like a traditional rocket. But glide smoothly back to Earth like an airplane. This gentle reentry saves a lot of wear and tear, and allows the shuttle to be reused many times. Talk about your high-tech recycling! This place is a tech lover's dream. The John F. Kennedy Space Center is run by the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, better known as NASA. Their mandate is to get things off the ground and into outer space, and they've gotten quite good at it. Here at the Space Center, we're surrounded by samples of stupendous spacefaring technologies, from rockets and lunar rovers to the space shuttle. Enormous dishes like this one are used to detect and communicate with objects in outer space, especially satellites. Satellites circling high above the Earth have transformed the modern world. They're the devices that help us predict the weather, keep an eye on the planet below, and even watch live news coverage from around the world. Engineering types like me really like to stay connected, you know. Vice. The cluster of silent sentinels here is called the Rocket Garden, a showcase of many different rockets used at the Kennedy Space Center. Rockets have had a long, impressive flight path of evolution. The earliest ones appeared in Asia over 1,500 years ago and didn't have much power. But today's modern rockets, like the powerful Saturn launch vehicle, put out seven million pounds of thrust or more. That's enough power to loft something bigger than a house up into space. It might look like a toaster with legs, but think again. That's one of the lunar landers used in the Apollo missions. Apollo was a Greek god of sunlight, and the Apollo program lived up to its name with a series of dazzling space flights in the 1960s that peaked with Apollo 11. The first time humans set foot on the moon. Bye for now. Feel free to call me back for more techno facts. There's nothing like a little southern exposure. Let's take a tour of Atlanta, Georgia. During the Civil War, 
General William Tecumseh Sherman marched through Georgia. After many fierce battles with the Confederate army, he captured Atlanta. And before continuing on his famous march to the sea, the Union general burned most of the city to the ground. It must have been quite a sight. Atlanta grew around the railroads and used to be called Terminus because it sits at the center of several railways. The city was heavily damaged during the Civil War, but that wasn't the end of the line. Atlanta eventually regrew and became a symbol of the reunion between North and South. Swan House. I promise you won't find any ugly ducklings here. It was built by Edward Inman, heir to a pre-Civil War cotton fortune, who also cottoned to beautiful buildings. Inside Swan House, you can see the original furnishings. Although built in 1928, the mansion is a perfect example of antebellum architecture and interior decoration. So long! Let's talk again soon! Antiquity, archaeologist extraordinaire. And when I'm not getting my thrills helping Acme agents catch Carmen's crooks, I earn my living digging up dirt on the distant past. Let me show you my latest find. Hawaiians carved fierce Im images of their gods, sometimes called tikis, to scare people away from sacred ground. Would you want to hang around with one of these guys looking over your shoulder? In former times, Hawaiians who broke the local rules, or kapu, were often sentenced to death. Their only hope was to reach one of these traditional areas, called a place of refuge, where they were forgiven by a priest for breaking the rules. Next time you dream of going to Hawaii, remember this. The islands are actually the tops of volcanic mountains, and some, like Kilauea and Mauna Loa, are still active. So on your next vacation, you may be in for a really hot time. In 1778, Captain James Cook sailed into these tropical islands, changing, and some people would say, spoiling Hawaiian culture forever. I guess you could say he was the first tourist. Hawaiian temples, like the one you see here, originally housed the remains of local chiefs. Hawaiians believed that great power rested not only with the gods, but also with their leaders. This power remained even after death. So the early Hawaiians made no bones about preserving old bones. I'm history. See ya! Aloha! Let's lay low on the big island of Hawaii. I'm history. See ya!
Let's stroll along Idaho's Snake River Plain, and I'll show you the sights. The one that I dropped when I got my death wound. Take it. Here in Idaho, folks know a good potato when they see one, because they see a lot of them. In fact, they grow more potatoes here than in any other state. And if you get tired of spuds, try the local peas, beets, and grains. You need to be well fed when you're fighting crime. And my six gun home to my kid brother after you buried me. There are really two different Idahos. The South, with its farms, cities, and big Mormon population, is a lot like Utah. The North, on the other hand, is more like Montana, rugged, mountainous, sparsely populated, and independent. But I don't take sides. I think they're both quite spectacular. Deep in the tomb, tell him these things are water in. That's the Sawtooth Range off in the distance. Part of the Rockies. Idaho has lots of mountains, so lots of skiers vacation here. Me, I'd rather climb up a mountain than slide down. His brother and never depart with the last fatal hang. But carry it always just as a reminder if ever he should come to this wild. We're standing on Idaho's Snake River Plain. Even though Idaho is huge, most of its people live within a hundred miles of this river. It's a great place to farm. The water is plentiful, the soil is great, and the view isn't bad either. Bye bye. Oh boy, Illinois, let me tell you what I know about Chicago. Chicago is the birthplace of the skyscraper, so it makes sense that it contains Sears Tower rising 1,454 feet above the city. Sears Tower is the tallest structure in the U.S. It also has the highest observation deck around, with a truly breathtaking view. If you're afraid of heights, don't look down. This is Buckingham Fountain in Grant Park. The flumes of water reach up to 150 feet high. During the summer, colored lights illuminate the showers of falling water, making for a beautiful but wet show. Anyone have an umbrella? If you're ever in Chicago and someone tells you to go jump in the lake, you'll know which one. This strip of water is just a small part of the mighty Lake Michigan, one of the Great Lakes. Chicago has inspired songs, poems, and novels. It's the center for the blues, one of my favorites, as well as the arts. It's also the third largest city in the U.S., despite the fact that almost the entire city burned down in the Great Fire of 1871. Talk about a hot time in the old town. See you later. Time to belt up, partner, for a spin around the Indianapolis 500 Speedway here in Indianapolis. I ask my love to take a walk. Indy race cars are engineered for outrageous speed, but a surprising number of common automotive concepts derive from racing technology.
over-the-shoulder seatbelts have first appeared in racing cars as a way to hold the driver firmly in place. Roll bars and energy-absorbing body panels also started with race cars to protect drivers during a crash. Who would have thought that high-risk racing could make regular driving safer for the rest of us? Whoa! Stop me if I'm drooling! These are indie cars designed for some seriously mind-bending speed! The first cars that raced here in 1911 reached top speeds of around 80 miles per hour, but woohoo! Has automobile technology improved since then? Today's indie cars streak along at over 220 miles per hour! That's practically warp speed! The Indy 500 track makes a winding circuit exactly two and a half miles long, which includes this blazing 1,000 meter straightaway along the grandstands. Originally, the track was paved with brick, but it was eventually resurfaced with smooth asphalt in 1935 to allow for higher speeds. Think they ever get any monster potholes out there? I could spend all day idling around here at the Indianapolis 500 Hall of Fame learning about the raceway. The Indy 500 was first held in 1911 and has run annually during Memorial Day weekend almost every year since. 500 miles of high speed action tend to draw big crowds and big prize money. Almost a half a million people come to watch the checkered flag wave over the lucky winning car, which claims a prize as high as three million dollars. Bye for now. Feel free to call me back for more techno facts. Here we are in Iowa, Des Moines to be exact. Let's have a look around. Now you probably recognize this fellow. This statue of Lincoln was based on a famous photo of old Abe reading to his son, Tad. There are tons of statues depicting Lincoln as a leader, but this is the only one known that portrays Lincoln as a father. Lucky for Tad, Abe was smart enough to make both a great president and a great dad. Iowa's capital was originally Iowa City, not Des Moines. But since Des Moines is in the center of the state, some folks thought it would make a better location for a capital. It took a lot of negotiation to make the move happen. But remember, negotiating is always better than fighting. Native people lived in this area long before Iowa became a U.S. state. In fact, scientists have found 3,000-year-old human bones nearby. Even the state's name, Iowa, came from a native Indian tribe. In a sense, we're all guests here, so remember, be polite. We're not far from the Amana colonies, villages founded in the 1850s by a German religious group who still farm together and make appliances and tools. Amana residents share all their belongings because acquiring personal wealth goes against their beliefs. That would be a tough idea for Carmen to understand, wouldn't it? And here's the Iowa State Capitol building. See the Golden Dome? That's real gold plating, over 200 ounces of it spread out ever so thin. 
The craftspeople who built this place took 15 years to do it. They took their time, but they got it right. Well then, until we meet again. Here we are in Kansas, in quite a lovely spot, the Spring Hill Prairie Reserve. Let's get started. Times was better then, boys, it was a better day. The way we drank and gambled and swung the girls around. The Kansas Prairie isn't as dramatic looking as some spots in the USA, but it's an important ecosystem, and it's almost extinct. That's why Spring Hill will soon be designated a national park because our natural history is worth saving. The crowd of Texas cowboys has come to take the town. If you think all grass is the same, look more closely at the prairie. There's blue stem grass, switchgrass, Indian grass, all different kinds. According to Native American healers, each grass has a different medicinal quality. And they ought to know they've been here a lot longer than you or I. For the last hundred years, Kansas has been covered with wheat fields. But before that, it was almost all prairie, rolling fields of tall grass. That grass fed millions of buffalo. But now both the buffalo and the grass are almost gone. Prairie preserves like this one at Spring Hill are the last refuge for plant and animal alike. So treat them kindly. If you ever see John Carter, you must meet him on the square. For he is the biggest cow thief. Spring Hill used to be a rich man's ranch. You can tell by this house. Stephen Jones built this stone mansion out in the prairie lands after he made his fortune in banking. Most of Kansas has rich, deep soil, while here at Spring Hill, it's rich but shallow, too shallow to plow in some places. So while the rest of the state turned into wheat fields, a little piece of prairie survived here. A link with the natural past. Just as wheat replaced the wild grass in Kansas, farm animals like cattle and sheep replaced the original wild animals. Without preserves like this one, there'd be no place for native prairie animals like buffalo, deer, foxes, raccoons, coyotes. The list goes on. Bye bye! And we're off to race around Churchill Downs, home of the Kentucky Derby. Kentucky is nicknamed the Bluegrass State after the grass that grows abundantly here. No, the grass itself isn't blue, but it does bloom with tiny blue flowers. Horses eat grass, and bluegrass grows in turf rich with calcium and lime, giving horses strong bones and muscles. That's why Kentucky ranks first in the breeding of thoroughbred horses. But I wonder who has to mow the lawn. The original grandstand was here on the east side of the track, which meant that spectators had to look right into the setting sun to see the race. Hmm, I wonder if that's what they mean by blinding speed. Anyway, it finally dawned on the owners to move stands to the opposite side, where they are now. You're looking at Churchill Downs, home of the world-famous Kentucky Derby. Churchill Downs was founded in 1875, and the Derby has been run here every year since. This place is so much fun, wild horses couldn't drag me away! The Kentucky Derby is the oldest continuously run racing event in the nation. 
horse racing fans call it the greatest two minutes in sports and the run for the roses. Three-year-old thoroughbreds race one and a quarter miles from start to finish. Ooh, I'd hate to run that far carrying someone on my back. Let me make a couple of points about the twin spires. These classic spires were built in 1895 and became the instant symbol of the Derby. The two steeples rise 120 feet into the blue Kentucky sky. That's about 12 stories high. It's quite an inspiring sight. So long. Let's talk again soon. Pleased to meet you. Herman Nutix, Ph.D. here, tenured professor of history, philosophy, and comparative religions at Acme Academy. Usually, I teach the other good guides, but now and then, I like to do some field work myself. Speaking of which, let's have a look around. The square is quiet now, but that's not always the case. Every year, just before Lent, New Orleans becomes one huge party with crowds, costumes, parades, dancing, and lots and lots of eating. It's called Mardi Gras. That's French for Fat Tuesday. Since Lent is the season for fasting, the idea was to have your last bit of fun before six weeks of sacrifice. Ask anyone. People here know how to have fun. This grand arched edifice is the Cabildo. The Spanish built it as their capital building back when Spain controlled this city in the late 1700s. Nowadays, it's a museum showcasing the different cultures of the area, going all the way back to the original Native American Indians. Intriguing stuff. Here's St. Louis Cathedral, the oldest Catholic cathedral in the USA. The French and Spanish people who built New Orleans were nearly all Catholic, so that religion has very deep roots here. In fact, Louisiana is the only U.S. state that's divided into parishes, which means church districts rather than counties. We're in Orleans Parish right now, in case anyone asks you. We're in Jackson Square, named for Old Hickory. Now, that's President Andrew Jackson. He first became famous here when he won the Battle of New Orleans in the War of 1812. His army was made up of white troops, two battalions of free black men, and even a hundred members of the Choctaw Indian tribe. Just like this town, Jackson's army was a real cultural mix. Here are the Pontalba Apartments, a fine example of this town's unique architectural style. You'll find multi-story decorative wrought iron balconies like this all over New Orleans. They're quite practical. In a hot, rainy town, you want a breezy outdoor space with a dry roof overhead. It's a sensible style with a magical look. New Orleans is not a typical American city. Many of the oldest U.S. cities were founded by a single country, like England. But New Orleans has a much more complex origin. It was a French settlement, then it was run by the Spanish, and later the U.S. bought it as part of the Louisiana Purchase. Now mix in immigrants from Africa, Italy, Ireland, and everywhere else, you get a very spicy town. Goodbye, then. It's been a pleasure.
mon ami. We're here in the French Quarter, an elegant part of New Orleans, Louisiana's most distinctive city. Let's go for a stroll, shall we? Goodbye, then. It's been a pleasure. I get all lit up about the Portland headlight standing guard here on the main coast. Let's scope the scene. The rope and Mary was West of here lies a forest of Maine's interior, thick with both perennial softwood and deciduous hardwood trees. Deciduous trees put the fall in the fall season. They've adapted to drop their leaves each year before freezing winter weather sets in. This prevents the trees from suffering frost damage or collapsing under the weight of heavy snowfall. When spring finally arrives, the deciduous trees grow a whole new set of leaves, starting the cycle anew. His own true love, his own fond love at home. They dearly... The beautiful Maine co coastline has dazzled generations of Americans. But ever wonder where it gets a unique craggy look? Two answers. Ice and ocean. The coastline here was once a glacier-covered series of mountains and valleys, which became partially submerged when the last ice age ended and the melting glaciers raised the sea level. The powerful wave action of the ocean then took over steadily wearing away at the new coast and giving it the rugged look you see today. We loved each other and we're doing... Off in the distance, you can ju just make out the skyline of Portland, Maine's largest city. Portland specializes in the production of pulp and paper. In fact, a surprisingly large proportion of paper made in the U.S. comes out of this single city. Next time you find yourself jotting a note, you may be riding on a thin slice of Maine. Join the wedlock band. The pudgy tugs over there are lobster boats, dedicated to the pursuit and capture of the enormous and delicious Maine lobster. Fishermen catch these giant red crustaceans using a clever trap called the lobster pot. It's a box-like device placed on the ocean floor which uses a tunnel of netting or a one-way trap door to entice the lobsters inside and then keep them there. The lobster pot doesn't actually harm the lobster, but the dinner pot isn't quite so kind. When Willie got his orders to sail to some foreign... This illuminating cyclops is a Portland headlight. It's the oldest lighthouse in Maine, and has been a real guiding light to ships entering Portland Harbor over the past 200 years. Talk about a long-lasting light bulb. Willie was as fine. West of here lies a forest of Maine's interior, thick with both perennial softwood and deciduous hardwood trees. Deciduous trees put the fall in the fall season. They've adapted to drop their leaves each year before freezing winter weather sets in. This prevents the trees from suffering frost damage or collapsing under the weight of heavy snowfall. When spring finally arrives, the deciduous trees grow a whole new set of leaves, starting the cycle anew. Bye for now. Feel free to call me back for more Techno Facts. A sailor has ever spliced a rope. And Mary was his own true love, his own... Hello, and welcome to Maryland. Let's walk the streets of Baltimore.
Francis Scott Key wrote the Star Spangled Banner right here on a ship in Baltimore Harbor during a battle in the War of 1812. It's a fine song from an awful war, but then all wars are awful. If you see big crowds, they're probably heading for the National Aquarium, home to more than 5,000 water creatures, ranging from shrimp and sharks to whales. Over one and a half million visitors come here each year, and one of those visitors might be working for Carmen. We could board the USS Constitution, but it's permanently docked, so we wouldn't get far. This grand vessel served 146 years in the U.S. Navy. They finally retired it when the warranty ran out. Many of Baltimore's baseball fans claim the legendary Babe Ruth as their own. He played mostly in Boston and New York, but he was born right here in a little house on Emory Street. Today it's a museum dedicated to the Babe. Ah, yes, the cafes and shops of Harbor Place. Baltimore's harbor area became a bit run down in the 1960s and 70s, but in the 80s it bounced back, and bustling malls like this one helped. Maybe next time you're here we'll have a fine meal together down by the waterfront. Well then, until we meet again. Here we are on my old stomping grounds, Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Time to perambulate. I'll sing you a song that's not very long about young men who wouldn't hold corn. The reason why no one can tell. Harvard is here in the city of Cambridge, just across the river from Boston. Cambridge is also home to MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. These two schools make this town a very important source of new thinking and research for our country and for the world, not to mention the Acme Detective Agency. Here's Widener Library, started in 1838 with John Harvard's personal collection. Since then, it's grown into the largest university library in the world with over 10 million books. That's even more than I've read. Oh, diddly I do diddly I do He planted his corn in the month of June, and in July it was knee high in September. Who else has walked here on Harvard campus besides you and I? Well, let's see. T.S. Eliot, Ralph Waldo Emerson, John F. Kennedy, and Franklin D. Roosevelt, among others. They all went to school here at Harvard, as did yours truly. Unlike those fellows, however, I didn't turn out famous, simply brilliant. There came a frost, and all this young man's corn was lost. Diddly I do, diddly I do, diddly I do. I'll sing you a song. The Puritans founded the country's first college here in 1636, just 16 years after they arrived in the New World. For its first two years, the new school had no name. But when a prominent minister named Reverend John Harvard died and left his books to the school, a new name was born. Harvard College, now part of Harvard University, has stood here ever since. Goodbye, then. It's been a pleasure. Eureka! Ready to make some discoveries at Michigan's Greenfield Village? Let's walk the walk!
I love visiting Greenfield Village, a place chock full of history about America's greatest inventive minds. The village is sort of an outdoor museum. 90 acres of land filled with transplanted buildings that were once the homes or workshops of some really innovative folks. Maybe someday I'll set up a workshop here too. Over this way lies the Logan County Courthouse, where Abe Lincoln practiced law years before becoming the 16th President of the United States. Life was pretty low-tech and simple back then, which explains why prairie lawyers like Lincoln had to travel around by horse, visiting the various courthouses of a regional circuit. Today's technology has improved things, making it much easier to get around and stay connected. Now if only we could replace all the lawyers with scientists. Side by side here, we have the Wright Home and Wright Cycle Shop, where the famous Wright brothers worked out their designs for the world's first machine capable of self-propelled flight, the airplane. Obviously, the brothers Wright got it right. If you've had enough of the great outdoors, you can always motor inside to the nearby Henry Ford Museum. There, you'll find over 100 historically cool, uh, I mean significant examples of automotive ingenuity, ranging from an authentic Model T to a moon-hugging lunar rover. Cars have fundamentally changed America in the last century, and Henry Ford had a lot to do with it. You got to move. You got to move. This thoughtful statue is none other than Thomas Edison himself creator of at least 400 great inventions. The building to the right is Edison's original Menlo Park Laboratory, where he made many of his best-known devices, like the electric light bulb and the phonograph, as well as hundreds of lesser-known things, like the telephone speaker. The brainy fellow held over 1,093 U.S. patents before he retired, which means I, I have some catching up to do. Bye for now! Feel free to call me back for more techno facts. You got to move, child. You got to move. But one and all. Hey there, let's take a minute to marvel at Minneapolis, Minnesota. This impressive site is the Basilica of St. Mary. A basilica is a cathedral that gets a promotion, and St. Mary's was the first one ever named in the United States. Many people come to visit this Roman Catholic church, so I guess you could say it's an example of mass transit. The Guthrie Theater is one of the nation's best-known theaters. It's home to a permanent group of actors who perform classical plays, such as Shakespeare's Hamlet. While in Minneapolis, if you start wondering whether to be or not to be, just check out the Guthrie. Here's a capital idea. Let's check out the Capitol building. It's more like a work of art, really, adorned with sculptures and murals by eminent artists. Even the roof is an artistic feat. It's one of the largest self-supporting marble domes in the world. Next time someone says, in a pig's eye, they may be talking about St. Paul. Legend has it that the city was originally named Pig's Eye after an old fur trader. As the city grew, it was renamed St. Paul and joined with the city of Minneapolis to become the Twin Cities. See you later.
Hello. I've got a river of information about Natchez, Mississippi. If you were living in the early 19th century, you might find your way here to Mississippi along the Natchez Trace, a historic wilderness road used by Indians and white settlers that connected the frontier states. Today, of course, you could just fly here directly and skip the mosquitoes. The town of Natchez was named after the Natchez Indians, who lived in the area before the arrival of the European settlers. Natchez means unknown, and there's much we don't know about this tribe. But we do know that the Natchez Indians believed their chief was descended from the sun god, and they carried him around on a litter so that his feet never touched the ground. You can just make out the Mississippi River in the distance. The Big Muddy is one of the longest and widest rivers in the world and is used by barges, ships, and impressive steam-powered paddle boats. The Edelweiss House is one of the many mansions that make Natchez such a picture-perfect place to visit. It's actually designed like a Swiss chalet, which is appropriate since an Edelweiss is a flower found only at high altitudes, like the Swiss Alps. This magnificent mansion is called the Parsonage House, so named because it was built as the home of a church minister. It's done in the bold artistic style called Greek Revival, but I haven't seen them revive any ancient Greeks yet. You can look north, east, and west, but you won't find a better symbol of the Old South than this mansion, the Rosalie. It was the first building designed in the famous plantation style. It's worthy of a great painting. See you later. Hi, let me show you St. Louis, here in the show me state. Okay, I'm taking you to court. The old courthouse, that is. This landmark was a site of the famous Dred Scott trial, which affected the fate of runaway slaves for years to come. Artifacts within the building tell the story of St. Louis, from its beginnings as a fur trapper's way station to a modern day metropolis. This is Bush Stadium. It was built in 1966 to match the nearby Gateway Arch. And of course, it's the home of baseball's St. Louis Cardinals. With all their pennants, the Cardinals may play in Bush Stadium, but they're definitely not Bush League. Although its big brother, the Mississippi, is more famous, the Missouri is actually the longest river in the United States. It flows out of Montana, then joins up with the Mississippi River just north of the Gateway Arch. How's that for current information? This is the extraordinary Gateway Arch. You can take a tram up each side of the arch to the top, which stands 630 feet above the city of St. Louis. Don't worry, it's safe. The arch is so well designed that it can withstand windstorms, lightning, and even earthquakes. It just can't stand straight. Completed in 1965, the Gateway Arch commemorates President Thomas Jefferson, who encouraged westward expansion with the Louisiana Purchase. When architect Eero Saarinen entered a design competition with this unusual piece, everyone loved his proposal. I guess this means the architect had no arch enemies. See you later. Same old
They call this part of Montana many glaciers because, well, because it has many glaciers. Let's look around. This particular part of Montana is right atop the Continental Divide. All the rivers and streams east of here flow toward the Atlantic Ocean, and those west of here flow to the Pacific. In other words, if you're looking for the middle, you're standing on it. In Montana, you won't find better lodgings than this. Many Glacier Hotel in Glacier National Park. A thousand miles of hiking trails start and end here at this cozy spot. And every night you can catch a lecture from a naturalist, a ranger. I've done a few myself. The ice age is over, but it's not dead here in Glacier National Park. Over 50 small glaciers dot the park, permanent ice sheets inching their way over the land. They're shrinking as the earth gets slowly warmer, but a couple of cool years will turn them around. Just wait and see. Well, I'm right. You're looking at Grinnell Point, named for George Grinnell, one of my heroes. He founded the Audubon Society back in the 19th century. We society members work to preserve wild animal habitats all over the world. It's never too early to join, by the way. This part of the astounding Montana landscape was carved by glaciers, huge moving sheets of ice that grew and retreated during the Pleistocene age. They slowly carved lakes, valleys, and peaks from the limestone, siltstone, mudstone, and every other stone in their way. Glaciers are slow, but watch out, they're strong. Bye-bye! What a hoot! The trains here at Omaha's Union Pacific Railroad Station in the heart of Nebraska get me all steamed up! One of my favorite figures in the history of the Old West has to be Grenville Dodge, the chief engineer of the Union Pacific. He was instrumental in surveying and building many of the crucial rail lines that crossed the western states. Believe me! It's not easy building a straight train track over hundreds of miles of rolling prairie land. Here's the Union Pacific Historical Museum, loaded to the caboose with history mementos about the UP, the nation's first transcontinental railroad. My favorite is a piece of golden spike used in Promontory, Utah in 1869 to celebrate the completion of construction. The Transcontinental Railroad made it much easier for settlers to travel in the West over the next 40 years. This resulted in a lot of growth and progress, but also in a few sad changes, like the rapid disappearance of buffalo herds and native Indian cultures. I love hanging out here at the rail yard, pondering the advances in locomotive technology over the years. Steam locomotives which burn coal to create steam to drive massive pistons were the name of the game for over a century. Massive models like this classic, Big Boy, were famous for their durability and mountain climbing power. Modern diesel electric models are even stronger. Some can pull 200 cars along at over 75 miles per hour.
Nebraska may be known as a farming state, but me, I think of it as a train state. Trains were essential to the expansion of Nebraskan farm towns like Omaha, allowing the transport of farm produce to distant cities. When President Lincoln created the Union Pacific Railroad in 1862, Omaha became its eastern terminus. Train transport and agriculture continue to be essential elements of Omaha life. Bye for now. Feel free to call me back for more techno facts. <laughs> I can tell you all about Las Vegas. Centuries ago, Spanish explorers blazed the old Spanish trail under a blazing desert sun and camped in a cooler area they called Las Vegas, or the Meadows. Later, Las Vegas became a railroad town. When gambling became legal, the sound of the slot machines replaced the screech of the train whistle. Today, Las Vegas is one of the fastest growing cities in the nation. Las Vegas has always been a hot spot. Literally, it's built in the hottest, driest part of the nation. If it weren't for nearby Hoover Dam, which provides both water and hydroelectric power, the city would dry up faster than a gambler's bank account. Neon signs make Vegas look modern, but people have lived in the area for 20,000 years. People called basket makers wove their way through the area long ago, and Paiute Indians have called Nevada home for ages. Of course, so has entertainer Wayne Newton. This is the famous Las Vegas Strip, one of the bright spots in Nevada. Neon signs and electronic billboards point the way to gambling casinos and extravagant hotels that look like Roman forums, Egyptian pyramids, and even a mini replica of New York City. All out here in the middle of the desert. So long! Let's talk again soon. New Hampshire's divine beauty is quite in evidence here. Please join me for a look around the Canterbury Shaker Village. He then called in his back. To the Shakers, equality between men and women was important. And this was back at a time when women weren't even allowed to vote in America. Here in the dwelling house, men lived on one side and women on the other, in nearly identical sets of rooms. They stayed separate, but they always shared in work, worship, and control of the community. Shaker women worked here in the sister's shop. Hands to work, hearts to God was their motto and it showed. Shaker tools, foods, and other products were top quality and sold well all over the country. Even today, original Shaker furniture is quite prized, therefore quite pricey. Here's the Shaker children's house. Their children lived with their caretakers. Shakers didn't believe in marriage or having their own offspring, but they adopted orphans, raised them, and cared for them. Once they reached adulthood, they could either stay in the community or move back out into society. The no marriage rule is the main reason the Shakers died out. Do you intend to take the old mill? Will you 
chapter. Canterbury was one of a dozen Shaker religious communities in the United States. During the 19th century, thousands of Shakers lived in communal farms like this one, sharing their belongings and praying and working together. The religion started in England, where its leader, Mother Anne Lee, was jailed for her beliefs. That's why the Shakers moved here, for religious freedom. Round and round. The Shakers weren't always called Shakers. They got the nickname because of how they worshipped. Here in the meeting house, men and women stood in separate groups facing each other, singing hymns and shaking with religious fervor. The religion's official name was the United Society of Believers in Christ's Second Appearing. Shaker is just a little catchier, I'd say. The fly whose name was Ralph, of every bushel I'll take one half, of every bushel that I shall grind, that I may an honest living find, the old mill wheel kept her. Like the Amish, the Shakers intentionally stayed apart from society. But while the Amish rejected technology, the Shakers liked it. In fact, they invented a lot of it. The circular saw, the flat broom, the cut nail, the clothespin, and the metal-tipped pen were all Shaker inventions. Were it not for these folks, you might still be writing with a quill today. Goodbye, then. It's been a pleasure. Round and round. Said my girl, you're quick and smart, no doubt intend to act your part, but you shall never have my mill, I'll never name you in my will. Let's have a look around the sandy Cape May, New Jersey, along the Atlantic coast. I don't see any on the horizon right now. But super tankers and super container ships are a common sight along the stretch of coast. Can you say humongous? Some of these ships stretch over 300 meters long. That's more than three football fields. This fence may look dull, but it actually serves a clever engineering purpose to keep the Jersey Shore on the Jersey Shore. Erosion poses a constant problem around here, as the ocean steadily washes away the beach. In fact, two previous versions of Cape May's lighthouse had to be rebuilt because of the advancing sea. Erosion control fences like this one were recently installed to hold beach dunes in place and hopefully keep the ocean at bay. Down this way you can see Cape May Point Light! One of the biggest lighthouses along the Atlantic coast. The latest version was constructed in 1859 and still shines out over the ocean for miles as a warning beacon to offshore ships. Man, we're talking one big light bulb. Bye for now. Feel free to call me back for more techno facts. I'll show you some intriguing sights here in Taos, New Mexico. The natives of the Southwest baked bread in ovens made of sun-dried mud bricks called adobe. Oddly enough, they used the same kind of adobe to build their houses. I hope that doesn't mean their homes were as hot as an oven. This is San Geronimo, one of many churches built by Spanish missionaries. 
Although European settlers and missionaries tried to influence native cultures, the Pueblo Indians are people after my own heart. They preserved their past despite outside influences, and their tribal customs have been mostly unchanged for centuries. The Taos Pueblo Indians hunted in the Sangre de Cristo Mountains where game was plentiful. They lived near the mountains in multi-leveled structures called a pueblo that looked a lot like a modern apartment building. But you can bet this place will never become a condo. The Spanish used the word pueblo meaning town to refer to the communal villages of the southwest native Indians. The Pueblo Indians are sometimes referred to as cliff dwellers because they often built their homes directly into steep cliff sides. But not all of them liked living on the edge. The Pueblo at Tahos was built on solid ground. Modern Pueblo Indians are believed to be descended from the Anasazi who built many storied homes thousands of years ago. It may be bad luck to walk under a ladder, but don't tell the Pueblos. Like their ancestors, they used long wooden ladders to move from floor to floor. I'm history. See ya! I hope you've got your passport handy, because we're going on a tour of Ellis Island and New York City! Take a look at Ellis Island, the gateway to America. During the early part of this century, up to five thousand people a day pass through Ellis Island. Today, the island is a museum honoring the thousands of immigrants who helped shape the United States into the marvelous mixture of cultures we find today. Among those buildings over there is Wall Street, the financial capital of the nation. Named for an earthen wall built by Dutch settlers centuries ago, Wall Street is now the home of the famous New York Stock Exchange and many leading financial firms. I hope that raises your interest. These skyscrapers are the twin towers of the World Trade Center, a focal point of international business. The towers stand among the tallest in the world. Each skyscraper has thousands of windows, 104 elevators, and lots and lots of business people. The perfect place for a socialite like me. Manhattan may have been the best bargain in world history. Dutch colonists purchased the island from native Indians in 1626 for about $24 worth of silver trinkets. Hmm, I think the rent has gone up since then. Do you know what this is? Okay, I won't leave you in suspense. It's the Brooklyn Bridge, one of the longest suspension bridges in the world. It spans the East River and connects Brooklyn to the island of Manhattan. If anyone tries to sell it to you, just ignore them. It's not really for sale. This magnificent copyment is the Statue of Liberty. Completed in 1886, the 151-foot-tall statue was the first object sighted by many immigrants sailing in from Europe. Lady Liberty herself is an immigrant. The statue was a gift from France, commemorating the long friendship between France and the United States. So long! Let's talk again soon!
Ah, Chapel Hill, the intellectual center of North Carolina. Time for a tour. Here's the Old Well, official symbol of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. But it's more than just a symbol. For the school's first few decades, this was the only source of water on the campus. That was before the days of Perrier and Evian. Not far from here is another sort of learning center, the Moorhead Planetarium. Scientists and astronauts go to Moorhead to learn their way around outer space. When you're going to travel that far, it pays to learn about your destination in advance. Ah, the Davy Poplar. Now, legend has it that founder William Davy rested under this very tree back in 1793 when he was picking the site for Chapel Hill University. Aside from starting the nation's first state-supported university, Davy was also one of the drafters of the U.S. Constitution. Busy man. No wonder he needed to rest. Chapel Hill makes up one of the points on North Carolina's Research Triangle. The other two points are claimed by Duke University and North Carolina State University. Inside this triangle, lots of research on lots of different subjects is carried out. The whole area is crawling with PhDs. It seems like you can't toss a Bunsen burner without hitting one. Goodbye, then. It's been a pleasure. Greetings. This is North Dakota's Bonanzaville Historical Center. Let's warm ourselves up with a brisk walk. This little prairie house is made of sod, blocks of thick dead grass cut from the prairie. Settlers learned to build sod homes from the Dakota Sioux, or allied tribes, who lived here for thousands of years before the Europeans showed up. The Haberstad family moved into this log cabin back in 1874. They were immigrants from Norway. During that decade, about 34,000 people moved here to the North Dakota Territory. The government gave away millions of acres in small land parcels to people like the Haberstads, immigrants with little money but enough energy to tame a wild place. Here in Bonanzaville, nearly all the buildings are old, but the town itself is new. The founders took historic buildings from all around North Dakota and moved them here, reconstructing a typical pioneer village. Of course, real pioneer villages didn't have tour buses parked just outside of town. Ah, the Fernberg General Store. Now, if you were a rancher around the town of Osgood and you needed 50 pounds of coffee, a barrel of nails, or a bottle of bull medicine, this was where you got it. Oh, and I'm pretty sure they didn't take credit cards back then. I'll heal my dreams in jest for my baby. This house came from Fargo, North Dakota, just up the road. It was the town's first permanent building. It may not look like much, but this little place was home to a pioneer family and the local jail and a hotel. I think room service was pretty slow back then. Goodbye, then. It's been a pleasure. Ah, 
Why, yes, University Circle in Cleveland, Ohio. I quite like this town, and I'm sure you will, too. See that pointy church spire behind those trees? Many Clevelanders call it the oil can church because it's shaped like an old-fashioned oil can. That nickname may seem a bit informal for a church, but that's Cleveland for you. Open-minded and tolerant, especially about religion. There's a wide range of different religious and ethnic groups here, so tolerance is a very sensible policy. Ah, the Cleveland Museum of Art! Now you could stand on these steps and survey all of surrounding University Circle. Schools, museums, lakes and gardens. Or you could wander inside and see 30,000 works of art spanning history and coming from places around the world. A tough choice, but either way, you can't lose. This pensive fellow is The Thinker, a replica of Rodin's famous original. The statue's left side was damaged during the 1960s by demonstrators protesting the Vietnam War. Instead of fixing it, the city decided to leave it broken as a reminder of the national turmoil of the time. Hmm, what would Rodin have thought? Cleveland's loudest landmark is the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, a new museum dedicated to the history of rock music. No one is exactly sure where the name rock and roll came from, but it was first popularized by a Cleveland disc jockey named Alan Freed back in the early 1950s. The music is still quite popular, or so I'm told. Goodbye, then. It's been a pleasure. Okay, let's tour Indian City, Oklahoma. Cotto Indian leaders often met in a building like this one, known as a council house. Plains Indians tribes were ruled by a chief, and the chief was advised by a council of elders. In some tribes, it was customary not to make a decision until everyone had spoken. So keep your comments brief, please. Many of the Plains Indians lived as nomads following the herds of buffalo, which they hunted from horseback. They often dried the meat by hanging it in the sun on racks like these. Anyone hungry? It's gonna rain, rain, rain. Well, well then stop still. Uh, listen to me. It's gonna it's gonna walk down it's down the rain and see. It's gonna gonna head the east. Some natives, like the Cotto tribe, lived a communal lifestyle, meaning they shared everything. Several families lived together in one large house made of poles topped by a grass roof. Only a few Indian tribes are native to Oklahoma. In the 1830s, many Indian tribes were forced to leave their native lands and relocate here in Oklahoma. Their forced march became known as the Trail of Tears due to the great hardships suffered on the long journey. Archaeologists, like yours truly, determined that native Indian tribes have lived on the Great Plains for about 6,000 years. Here at Indian City, you can see recreations of seven native villages and watch traditional dances and ceremonies. But be careful, you might get a sudden urge to hunt buffalo. I'm history. See ya! Ah, uh, ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs>
<laughs> we'll start our Oregon exploration here in Washington Park, just outside Portland. Come on, let's look at the landscape. A hundred and fifty years ago, there was no city here at all, just wilderness. Then the Oregon Trail brought settlers from the east. They were looking for a place with more opportunity. And unlike Carmen's crooks, they were willing to work hard for their fortunes. Here's what makes Washington Park smell so good. The International Rose Test Gardens. You're looking at 10,000 rose bushes of 400 different varieties. And if you get here in June, you'll see them all bloom at once. It's worth the trip. It's not summer in Portland without a show at the Washington Park Amphitheater. Oregonians love outdoor theater. In the mountains south of here, the Ashland Shakespeare Festival has four stages full of drama and comedy. Fine culture in the midst of beautiful nature. It's a perfect combination, if you ask me. For a city, Portland isn't so bad. Maybe it's all the green grass and trees. I'm even rather fond of the rainy weather. If you want to stay dry in Oregon, you have to head east to the arid Columbia Plateau. Here on the western side of the state, wet is what you get. Oregon harvests more lumber than any other state, and that's why the World Forestry Center is here. Pine forests cover half the state, and preservationists like me make sure that the wood is carefully harvested, not needlessly stripped. You're looking at my favorite thing about Portland, its view of Mount Hood, Oregon's highest mountain. I'm quite fond of snow-capped volcanic peaks, and they don't come much nicer than this one. Majestic, isn't it? Bye-bye! Friendly? Let's visit Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Over here we have Independence Hall where the Second Continental Congress met. Once called the State House, this historic building witnessed the birth of a new nation. Look out while you're stuck your stuff. Look out, baby. You can't help but love Philadelphia. The word is Greek for city of brotherly love. Its pen was a Quaker, but it was later residents who really shook things up during the Revolutionary War. I don't get well, this is very appealing. It's the Liberty Bell, which rang out in 1776 on the day the Declaration of Independence was first read to the people. Trouble is, the massive bell couldn't quite handle all the excitement of a new country. It cracked twice over the course of its life before finally being retired in 1835. Luckily, the Liberty Bell has proved stronger in spirit than form and continues to serve as a symbol that freedom in America rings on. Benjamin Franklin's house no longer stands here in Franklin Court, but Franklin's influence can still be felt. He helped write the Declaration of Independence and pioneered ideas such as fire departments and street lights. And as the first U.S. postmaster, Old Ben definitely put his stamp on history. Stop your Two of the most important documents in history were completed right here at Independence Hall. The Declaration of Independence and the United States Constitution. Now those are words to live by. I'm history. See ya!
time for a tour of Toro Park here in Newport, Rhode Island. Over here, we have my favorite nook, the Newport Art Museum. Stick around and you'll notice it was built in the stick style, a type of architecture characterized by the intricately carved wooden latticeworks used for decoration. The exhibits in the museum feature art from both Newport and the surrounding New England area. Not far from here, you can find Toro Synagogue, the oldest Jewish temple in the United States. It's also considered a masterpiece of 18th century colonial architecture. You could say the architect had a unique angle. He built the synagogue with a particular orientation in mind, facing directly towards far off Jerusalem. This is Charming Toro Park, named after Isaac de Toro, who arrived in Rhode Island in 1758. And I can understand why he came here. Many historians claim that Charming Newport was America's first resort town. Wealthy merchants have been vacationing here for over 200 years. Two statues in Toro Park represent two different kind of pioneers who both made their start in Newport. Right here we have Commodore Matthew Perry, the explorer who opened up trade between Japan and the world. Over at the Channing Memorial Church, the nearby building with the dramatic spire, you'll find the statue of William Ellery Channing, the leader of the Unitarian Church. If you see people milling about this old structure, known as the Old Stone Mill, they're probably looking for kernels of truth about an old rumor. You see, many people believe that the mill is a remnant of an ancient Viking tower. No one has ever confirmed the legend, but many historians think that the structure was actually a windmill built by a descendant of Benedict Arnold, the infamous American traitor. See you later. Here we are in charming Charleston, South Carolina. Let's take a walk and see what we find. South Carolina's first English settlers landed here in Charleston, or Charlestown Landing as it was called back in 1670. In its first 100 years, this place grew from a poor little village to a rich, ritzy city. If you made a fortune from a plantation, you spent it on a big mansion in Charleston. The town is still rather elegant today, wouldn't you say? Out there in the distance lies Patriot's Point, a floating naval museum. There you can tour four huge docked vessels, a submarine, an aircraft carrier, a destroyer, and a nuclear-powered merchant ship. Most of these boats were designed for use in warfare, and they cost many millions to build. That's the price America pays to defend its freedom. I'd take you on an onboard tour myself, but I, I get woozy just standing on the dock. Recognize that island fortress? It's Fort Sumter, where the Civil War began. When South Carolina left the Union, they demanded that federal troops give up the fort. When the Union soldiers refused to leave, the war's first shots were fired. The South took Sumter, and the North spent two solid years trying to get it back, firing seven million pounds of ammunition in the process. You can't tell it from here, but the place is quite dented up.
This lovely park at the peninsula's tip is White Point Gardens. Most folks call it the Battery, after the battery of cannons that line the water's edge. From those very cannons, the Civil War's first shots were fired across the water at Fort Sumter. It's a much quieter place now, and I, for one, prefer it that way. Colonel Charles Alston, a wealthy rice planter, once lived in this grand antebellum mansion. In case your Latin is rusty, antebellum means before the war, meaning this mansion was built before the Civil War. From the columns in front, there's a grand view of Charleston Harbor, which has a long and memorable history. In those very waters, Blackbeard the Pirate once dropped anchor. Goodbye, then. It's been a pleasure. South Dakota has many dramatic vistas, but Mount Rushmore stands at the head of the class. Big head, that is. Did someone say vertigo? The Iron Mountain Road on the opposite side of Mount Rushmore is quite a heart-stopping adventure. It zigzags up steep slopes and navigates several tunnels and bridges before reaching the top of the mountain, over 500 feet above us. You think building the sculpture was hard? Just getting up there is an engineering feat. The stony faces before us are carved from pure granite, a low-tech material which has some high-tech properties. Granite is so hard that dynamite blasts were needed for much of the carving, and it's so tough that weather hardly makes a dent. Over the next 10,000 years, these four presidential heads will erode only a fraction of an inch. You're looking at the Shrine of Democracy, the faces of four famous presidents carved into the side of Mount Rushmore here in the Black Hills of South Dakota. This famous national monument, created by sculptor Gutzon Borglum, is a memorial to the democratic spirit of the United States and dedicated people who kept the spirit alive. The sculpture took over 14 years to complete, a real act of dedication in itself. From this distance, the heads on Mount Rushmore don't look too big, but stand closer and you'd realize they're simply huge! George Washington on the left has a head over 60 feet high! The noses of Jefferson and Roosevelt are at least 20 feet tall! And Honest Abe Lincoln? His eyes are about 11 feet wide! Bye for now! Feel free to call me back for more Techno Facts! Hello, let's see if Nashville, Tennessee, home of country music, strikes a chord with you. One of Opryland's many attractions is the General Jackson Showboat Review, a floating musical extravaganza on the world's largest showboat. It's a spectacle that really makes a splash. I'm too old to learn a new trade. You ain't nothing but a hound dog if you don't know that Elvis Presley lived right here in Tennessee in a mansion called Graceland. Presley was more than just a great performer. His unique blending of different musical styles changed rock and roll music forever. What can I tell my wife? Went into my place this morning. And I got down on my knees. I couldn't roll no call. In Tennessee, 
you can visit the Grand Ole Opry. That's Opry, not opera, so don't expect anyone to start singing in Italian. The Grand Ole Opry has been performing country music before a live audience since 1925. It started in the famous Ryman Auditorium in downtown Nashville, but has since moved to Opryland. The most famous names in country music have performed at the Grand Ole Opry, including Roy Rogers, Johnny Cash, and Garth Brooks. So, if you want to be a country music star, polish your boots, tune up your guitar, and head on out to the Opry. See you later. Howdy, partner. Let's mosey through the Alamo here in San Antonio. You could say the Alamo was on a mission to become famous. It began as a collection of small huts, then grew into a Spanish outpost, and eventually it became a full-fledged mission when the first church was built in 1758. Remember the Alamo! And don't forget the monument you see here called the Cenotaph. It's dedicated to the 189 fallen heroes of the Alamo, one of the most famous sites in United States history. Texas is the largest of the contiguous 48 states, which is good because everybody seemed to want a piece of it. Texas was colonized by Spain, then belonged to Mexico, then became an independent republic. Phew! Finally, it joined the United States in 1845 as the 28th state in the Union. One of the Alamo's best-known heroes was Davy Crockett, who was a member of Congress as well as a soldier. He was from Tennessee, not Texas, but he had sworn to fight tyranny wherever it appeared. So he rode to the aid of the Alamo. Now that's courage! When Mexican dictator Santa Ana demanded surrender, the Alamo's defenders answered with a cannon shot. For 13 days, the small band of Texans defied an army of 4,000 until the last man fell. Six weeks later, Texan reinforcements, led by Sam Houston, defeated the Mexican army, shouting, Remember the Alamo as they attacked. I'm history. See ya! Here we are in Utah, Zion National Park to be exact. Ready for a nature walk? If you're very quiet, I'll introduce you to some of my wild friends who live here in Zion. The bobcats, mountain lions, coyotes, bighorn sheep, and their other untamed associates. Believe it or not, these animals are actually rather shy. But considering how some people treat them, I don't blame them for avoiding us humans. Here's Zion Lodge, the only place in Zion National Park where you can rent overnight accommodations. Clarence Underwood designed it back in the 1920s. Most man-made buildings tend to clash in natural settings, but this one, designed with nature in mind, fits in quite nicely. Long before Zion was a canyon, it was a swamp. Then the weather got drier, and layers of sand blew in and mixed with the mud and minerals. 
Then the shifting earth raised up all those caked layers of sand and dried mud thousands of feet above sea level. Finally, the Virgin River started carving it away, little by little, till it looked like this. Pretty cool, huh? I could go on all day about the geology. Watch your step while you're walking here. The surrounding land is made of sedimentary rock, which could probably also be called sandimentary rock, since it contains lots and lots of tightly layered sand. Either way, one thing's for sure. Sandy rock is slippery rock. I've taken a few spills in this park, and I'd hate to see you do the same. Geologist Leo Snow first surveyed this place for the U.S. government back in 1908, and he made sure to note how beautiful it was. The following year, President Taft made it into a national monument, and ten years later, Congress declared it a national park. Some things are definitely worth preserving in their natural state. Bye-bye! Undercover. Under a covered bridge, that is, in West Arlington, Vermont. Here's one of Vermont's charming covered bridges. Vermont's economy was a bit slow in the early 1900s, so the state took its time replacing the old wooden covered bridges with newer metal models. Locals eventually recognized the historic value and the tourism appeal of these rustic bridges and started preserving them before they were all gone. building is the inn at the covered bridge. It was built as a tavern in 1792, and its front yard was used as a practice field by Revolutionary War hero Ethan Allen. Later, it served as the home for another type of American hero, artist Norman Rockwell. How's that for some inside information? Dairy farms like this one are important to Vermont. The state produces millions of gallons of milk every year. That fills a lot of cereal bowls. It also makes for a lot of ice cream. Just ask a certain Vermont ice cream company famous for its wacky flavors. Hmm, this may sound sappy, but I dearly love maple syrup. In the spring, Vermonters tap maple trees for their sap, which is boiled down to a sugary liquid. Isn't that sweet? White frame churches like this one are typical in the small towns of Vermont. You can usually find them on the main street, also called the Village Green. Their rural charm and elegance may make other buildings, well, uh, green with envy. So long! Let's talk again soon. Welcome to Colonial Williamsburg, Virginia, a reconstructed city from the days before the American Revolution. Let's take a walk. Here's the stately home of George Wythe, a famous lawyer and judge who was the first Virginian to sign the Declaration of Independence. Wythe was Thomas Jefferson's mentor and greatly influenced Jefferson's ideas about law, politics, and government. And just like his student, Wythe had great taste in big brick houses. On the Georgia Bay, 
Quite a few of the United States' founders lived in or near Williamsburg. After all, this was the first colony to declare independence from England. Richard Henry Lee, Patrick Henry, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, and other founding fathers called Virginia home. Williamsburg today, as a small, elegant town, doesn't seem too important. But in colonial times, Williamsburg was a crucial place, a training ground of sorts for the Virginians who led the American Revolution. It was the biggest and richest of England's colonies with great political power. Unfortunately for England, all this power and wealth eventually convinced the American colonists that it was time to start controlling their own fate, independently of England. Here's the apothecary, sort of an old-fashioned pharmacy. Dr. William McKenna worked here. If you needed a medical procedure, say leeching or bloodletting, he was the man to see. It wasn't a great idea to get sick back then. Here's the governor's palace. Before the revolution, England's king sent his governor here to rule the colony. But after gaining their independence, Virginians ruled themselves. And one of the first things they did was move the capital from Williamsburg to Richmond. Well then, until we meet again. Forgive me while I prattle on about Seattle. Awnings like these are common in Seattle, where rain clouds are a familiar sight. Moist air blows in from the nearby Pacific Ocean, frequently showering rain on the city. The rainy season can sometimes last for ten months out of the year. Now, where did I put my umbrella? Here's Pike's Place Market. You'll find a whole community of farmers, fishermen, and craftspeople ready to sell you handmade jewelry, fresh seafood, and loads and loads of fine produce. Hmm, I hope you like broccoli. <laughs> Seattle, Washington is home to the world-famous Space Needle, a 600-foot high tower that was built for the 1962 World Fair by architects who had a point to make. If alternative music strikes a chord with you, you'll love Seattle, the home of the grunge movement and the starting point for many popular rock music groups. I just wish they'd learn to dress a little better. So long! Let's talk again soon. Welcome to Washington, D.C. The capital awaits us, so let's explore. Here's a popular spot.
spot on the Washington Mall, the Museum of Natural History. If you're looking for dinosaur bones, this is the place. You'll also find lots of other exhibits on the history of our planet. Will you find a crook? That I can't say. I'm amazed by the White House, and here's why. In a lot of countries, the leaders keep their distance from the people. But not here. The first family lives in a house that thousands of tourists visit every week. Just think, you could be admiring the White House banisters while the president brushes his teeth only a few rooms away. Now that's democracy. Look closely at the Washington Monument. See how the color changes halfway up? That's because they halted construction during the Civil War and didn't get going again for another 25 years. By that time, they couldn't find marble that matched the original. With all the political folks here in Washington always ready to argue, it's a wonder they ever finished the monument at all. There's no king in Washington, D.C., but here's the castle. That's the nickname of the Smithsonian headquarters. This was the first of the dozen Smithsonian museums now existing here in Washington. And no, they never dug a moat around it. Washington wouldn't be the capital without a capital building. And here it is. Under that dome, you'll find senators and congressmen, both Republican and Democrat. These are the men and women who make the laws of the USA. Your job, Gumshoe, is to catch the thieves who break those laws. Well then, until we meet again. We're in Harpers Ferry, West Virginia. There's a lot to see, so let's start looking. This is John Brown's Fort. In 1859, the anti-slavery preacher led a raid on the U.S. Armory here in Harpers Ferry. This is the only building left here from that time. Brown's raid heightened the tensions growing between the North and South, and the Civil War broke out soon afterwards. Before 1861, there was no state called West Virginia. But when Virginia split from the Union at the start of the Civil War, the people in its western counties decided to separate from Virginia and join the North. For a while, they called their state Kanawha, but the name didn't stick. And West Virginia soon became the new state's official name. The Baltimore Railroad runs over this bridge. Before the Civil War, those tracks brought prosperity to Harpers Ferry. It takes people and commerce to make a city grow, and that's exactly what the railroad carried into town. Here, where the Shenandoah and Potomac Rivers come together, once stood the U.S. Armory, a place packed full of weapons and ammunition. The Confederate Army destroyed it during the Civil War to prevent the Union from using the deadly armament against them. Now the place is a park. A far better choice, if you ask me. Up until the 1860s, Harpers Ferry was a big, bustling port with factories and lots of people. But because of its strategic location between the North and South, it was a prime place for fighting during the Civil War. And as a result, the town was almost totally destroyed. 
It never grew back into a big city, and I hear that's just fine with the local folks who like it quiet. Well then, until we meet again. Where in the world but in Wisconsin would you find a place like this? Nowhere, that's where. Let's explore the Freshwater Fishing Hall of Fame. If you... There's the Wisconsin State Fish, a type of northern pike called the muskelung. Of course, that's not a real muskie. It's a four-story building shaped like one with an observation deck in its mouth. If that were real, it would be swimming in a freshwater lake, and it would be slightly smaller. Just the motor off my luck, the battery die. Oh, I look. No, you're not seeing things. That's a really big bass made out of fiberglass. Wisconsin's fishermen love nothing more than to sit in bass boats on lakes up north and troll for these wide mouth babies. They prefer the non synthetic type, of course. I'm told fiberglass isn't very tasty. All this Wisconsin fishing lore could make a great saying. Give a man a fish, feed him for a day. Teach him to fish, feed him for life. Sometimes I add a third line. Steal a man's fish and Acme will reel you in. You don't find huge fish statues everywhere in Wisconsin, just here in Hayward at the Freshwater Fishing Hall of Fame. A hundred thousand people a year see these exhibits. Mounted trophy fish, big outboard motors, even hooks that have been pulled out of fishermen. I bet you didn't know fishing could be so exciting. Bye-bye! Keep that motor running, Jock, so I won't be long on the inside. Oh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> Wyoming is wonderful, especially Grand Teton National Park. The mountains await us, so let's start our trek. One of my favorite things about this place is the people, because there aren't very many. In fact, even though it's the ninth largest state in area, Wyoming has a smaller population than any other U.S. state. With so few people around, the beauty of nature really gets a chance to shine. Of all the different ranges in the Rocky Mountain system, the Tetons are the youngest. That's part of the reason they're so tall, jagged, and angular. The wind and weather hasn't had time to wear them down yet in a process called erosion. In a few million years, they'll be rounder, like me. Wyoming has lots of amazing scenery, but nothing tops the Teton Range. Those 13,000-foot peaks are amazing from every angle, and they hide a wealth of coal and other minerals. Speaking as a highly trained geologist, I can describe the Tetons with one highly technical word. Wow! <music> Wyoming isn't all mountains. In its flatter parts, ranchers raise cattle and sheep. But the land is rugged, and the grass is thin, so it takes about 50 acres just to feed one cow. If you were a cowboy here, you'd ride lots of miles rounding up your herd. Bye-bye! <laughs>